Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And we are going to look at... We'll do a, a quick review, but this is where we're going to be at. So Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 through the... No, that's the new covenant. No, verse 26, I'm sorry. 26 to the end of the chapter. So Hebrews 9, 26 to the end of the chapter, which is uh, 26, 27, and 28. And if you're there, let's all stand in reverence to God's Word. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, if you're able. If not, we certainly understand. You can remain seated. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, the Bible says this, For then must he oft have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. My message tonight, this is talking about, we're still talking about a better covenant with a better sacrifice, but our final point in this cha chapter is once for all. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word and God that we can count on it, we can trust it, Lord, that we can live by it. Lord, I pray, Father, that we would do that. I ask God that you would help each and every heart here, that Lord, we would concentrate on your word that we would remove all the distractions and be at work or school or home or whatever it might be father we would give you this time and lord i pray father that there would be something in this lord we know that you're there's always something in your in your book that is life-changing god that there would be something presented tonight that would cause us to change our perspective maybe change our focus we love you we praise you in jesus name amen you may be seated. We've talked about, uh, in the first few uh, verses of this chapter, we talked about the ordinances of the fleshly uh, uh, sanctuary, and specifically the tabernacle. Then we moved on and we went through that. Then we looked at the new tabernacle, and the Bible gave us kind of a, a comparison. and That was Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. And then last time... I was with you. We talked about the new covenant. We talked about the testament, the death. A testament is not enforced until you have the death of a, the testator. We talked about the fact that this is a special contract. It's a special testament. It, it's a special covenant. And, and the word means all of those things. That, that testament means contract, covenant. It also means will. And so when we talked about the fact that, because we sign a lot of contracts, and no one has to die. Uh, and, and yet here we were told in Hebrews that uh, this covenant is not enforced uh, without the death of the testator. So uh, we kind of, I spent a lot of time looking at uh, that particular week, looking at what, what kind of a contract is it that you have to die for? in order for it to be enforced, and of course it's a will. We're co-heirs with God, there's inheritance for the Christian. And so, when Jesus died, this will, this contract was put in force. And, and we talked about kind of the two aspects of that. The, the, the idea that first you have the blood atonement. Most Christians have a pretty decent understanding of that. Not, not fully, but... Um, most have a pretty decent understanding of the idea, at least of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sins of the world, that he took on all of the sins of the world. But there's an, also an idea here that in this contract, when Jesus died, you and I were given an inheritance through that contract. And so we spent some time talking about that. But now we move on to the end of this chapter, and this is the three verses that it ends with. The Bible says, For then must he often 
often had suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Well, what's he talking about here? He's looking again. We've started off with the old tabernacle, compared it to the new tabernacle. Then he looked at the covenant. Now we're looking at the old sacrifices compared to the new sacrifices. Because remember when he went into that, he talked about how all things were purged with blood. And so now we're looking at the difference between those old sacrifices and the new one. It, it is a one-time sacrifice that Jesus Christ did on the cross. And when we say once for all, most Christians understand what that means. And most of us say amen to that. Once for all. Amen. Uh, and, and when we say amen to that, one of the things that we're looking at is we're going, well, um, that means Jesus Christ died one time and He put away all sins once and for all. Sins are put away now forever. No more sins because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Once for all. But it's a double-edged sword as well. And we're going to see that as we go through. Look again at the context in Hebrews 9.23. The Bible says it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. Talking about the things that happen on earth. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Difference between the Mosaic law and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Or the sacrifice on the altars and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. We're seeing that comparison. Old tabernacle, new tabernacle. He's not going into the, new, the old tabernacle. He's going into the new one. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. Well, what's he saying? Well, the high priest used to have to go in and he would have to redo those sacrifices because, uh, because Pastor Yant kept sinning. Because Travis kept sinning. Jason Lanfear kept going fishing. And so, and so the high priest had to keep had to keep going in and he had to keep he had to keep putting that sacrifice and he had to keep and the Bible says that it did purify the sins it didn't forgive them but it purified them. we're gonna see that in a second he says uh, verse 24 for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands which are the figures of the true but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, listen to this, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As in, is it appointed once as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So we see kind of a, a scary part of this. See, th this is the thing, is down here on this earth, the high priest could go in and Ethan had sin. The high priest would, would sacrifice a bullock. The nation of Israel would sin. Sacrifice that bullock once a year, or that lamb once a year. And there would be a sacrifice that would happen often for the sins of, of men. And the Bible tells us that the priest would stand daily ministering. When Jesus Christ died, we're going to get into this, the Bible says that he sat down. That was it. This is over. It's done. But, but there's a couple things that are interesting about this because when we think about the sacrifice of sins once for all, we often think, well, it ended sin. Oh, well, that's true, but it ended everything. 
The Bible says that for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are figures of the true. Do you understand that tonight you and I have figures of God in just about everything? They're figures of, in God in just about everything. In the last two chapters, we've talked a lot about the tabernacle or the law of Moses, the tabernacle of the law or the tabernacle of Moses, whichever you want to call it. Verses 1 through 5 of this chapter opened up with the articles or ordinances, the things that were in that first tabernacle made by men. Then he compares it to the new tabernacle, the one that will be in heavenly Jerusalem which I believe, and I presented to you, that that tabernacle is not really a thing as much as it is a person. Revelation 21.3, the Bible says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and listen to this, and he will dwell with them. It, it goes straight from the tabernacle to he. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. The Bible says in Revelation 21, there's no temple. And the difference, the only difference between the temple and the tabernacle was the tabernacle was mobile. They used the tabernacle in the wilderness because they moved from place to place to place to place. Once the temple was established, it stayed there. So why isn't the temple of God with men? Because it's the tabernacle here is God and he's going to be with you in a way that you and I can't even fathom. We can't even understand. This is not just an Old Testament or a New Testament command or, or promise. This is an Old Testament promise as well that there would come a point in time where God would know all of them. No one would need to be taught about God anymore because they would all know Him from the greatest to the least, to the least to the greatest. You're going to know God. And it's going to be in a way that you, we can't fathom on this earth. I, I can only, if I want to hang out with Harlan, I can only hang out with him certain times of the day. If I want to hang out and go fishing with, with um, Brother, Brother Lanfear, I can only hang out with him for certain times of the day. It's not something I can do all the time. We can't just hang out all the time, 24-7. Yet everyone in this room that is saved someday is going to have 24 Seven day a week, there's no time in heaven, so, but I'm trying to make it in terms we can understand. You're going to have constant access to an almighty God. And, so, and we see that with the Old Testament and the New Testament. So what, what, what's the point? What are we trying to get to here? Have you ever heard the phrase, everything's bigger in Texas? Yeah, uh, I have a son that's in Texas. And so are their egos and their mouths. They're bigger in Texas too. I'm just kidding. Some of them listen to this, so I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm, I like Texas. But uh, there's that phrase, everything's bigger in Texas. Well, can I just tell you today, everything's better in heaven. And all of the figures and likenesses that we have now, they're going to end too, all because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. When it's once and for all, it ended everything that represented Christ because someday you and I are going to be with him all the time. And let me just give you some, let me give you some things and give you some scriptures to kind of help understand that because when we say once for all, everyone always just thinks about the sacrifice or, or Jesus doing away with sin once for all. But it's, it's more than that. In Hebrews 9.24, he talks about the figures of the true. That that's what these sacrifices were. They were figures. They were just pictures of the true. Verse 23. Even though that pattern was there, it is still different and was not good. And that's true with everything that represents Christ on this earth. The, the law was flawed, but the law had a purpose. And that's true with everything that is a like figure of Jesus Christ now. The church is a picture of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's flawed, but it's a picture. The marriage is a picture of Jesus Christ. It's flawed, but it's a picture nonetheless. Uh, 
The family is a picture of Almighty God and His relationship. It's flawed, but it's a like figure nonetheless. Government is a picture of God. It's flawed, but it's a picture nonetheless. When the Bible says once for all, all of those things ended. All of those things will end. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 31, the Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Why is that so important in marriage? A husband loves his wife as Christ loved, gave him, loved, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Why is that so important? Well, it's a picture. It, it, it's a picture of Christ in the church. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, the Bible shows us that there's going to come a day where the church is going to be replaced. And I'm looking forward to that day when the, when the real pastor stands up. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, the Bible says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the, just, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 27, we see the picture in the church where the body of Christ. Verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church. And he goes through the, the, the offices that he set up. The family, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. What? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Everything that we have down here is a cheap counterfeit. Now, I don't know about you. I look at my marriage. I kind of like my cheap counterfeit. It's all I know. And I'm sure sometimes my wife has a problem with her cheap counterfeit. Sometimes I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little bit too cheap. But, but it's, you know, and, and a lot of times too, when things go well in these, in these institutions that God has set up, they are a little bit, you'll hear this and you've heard me say it, that marriage is like a little bit of heaven on earth. And, 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 and I'll tell you this all the time. I'm like the greatest thing God ever gave mankind was marriage. Marriage is awesome. When marriage is done well, it is awesome. Same thing can be true of the church, the family, and even the government. Luke chapter 1 verse 32, it's a cheap counterfeit what we have down here. And some of us are going, yeah boy. Governments nowadays are a very cheap counterfeit, but they're still a picture of Christ and God nonetheless. Luke chapter 1 verse 32, we see someday that counterfeit's going to end and the real one's going to step forward. The Bible says, He shall be great and he shall be called the Son of the Highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of David his father uh, or his father David, sorry. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Kingdoms come and go and governments come and go. But someday that's, not, that's all going to be done away with. There's only going to be one. It's going to last forever. There's some lessons in this. You say, well, what, what's the significance of this? Well, there's lessons in this that you and I should not be quick to dismiss. Because this is the thing. Satan is going to do everything he can, and we've already seen it, to attack these institutions. Why? Because they are like figures. And if he can mess up the family, he'll change the view of God in the eyes of your children. If he can mess up your marriage, I remember years ago in my teen class, I had this young man that was struggling and we were, we were talking about, we were talking about getting married and I said, well, someday 
I said, someday you're going to get married. He said, no, I'm not. I said, why would you say that? He said, because I saw the marriage that my parents had. And he said, I, I don't want anything to do with it. And I'll tell you what, that young person had a real tough time with church as a result of that. Why? Well, because it's a like figure. When the Jews messed up the law, not only did they not see the Messiah that the whole law was pointing to all that time, they murdered him. They killed him. And when we say things like once for all and everyone thinks, well, Jesus did away with sin once for all. No, he's doing away with all of these like figures that we see in verse 23. All of these like figures are going to be gone someday. That's what once for all is done. It's all encompassing with him. All of these things are going, to be, are going to be representative of Him. All of these things, we're going to be in subjection to Him. So Satan is doing everything he can right now in our society to attack what marriage is. Now, two guys can get married. Two girls can get married. Now, well, it's a family if there's love. No, it's not. Uh, well, you've got, you've got uh, uh, this attack on the family as a whole that Satan is conducting you've got this attack on marriage you've got this attack on church man today so many christians think church attendance is suggestive or optional at best and 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 so the picture of church has been completely destroyed it's become casual and, and a lot of people don't think well what's the big deal with a casual church because you serve a holy and a just god and so what happens is when we get to the point where everything becomes casual, the way, that we, the way that we reverence this God also becomes casual. And the way that we take Him becomes casual. His Word becomes casual. And then you end up with Christians that have been in church for generations and decades. Me and my son have talked about this. They see this more in the Bible Belt. But people don't even show up. They tithe to a church they never go to there. I mean, think about that. It's just become generational. We don't necessarily see that on the West Coast like they do in places like the Bible Belt, but it's just the picture of the church, the like figure that it represents, is totally destroyed. And so people's perception of God is destroyed. It, it becomes ruined. The Old Testament sacrifice was a picture of things to come. It had some power that we see in verse 13. Look at verse 13 of our text. In Hebrews chapter 9, the Bible says this, For if the blood of bulls, if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, we don't generally think about that. We're constantly, when we make the comparison, we're going, well, the blood of goats and bulls didn't do anything. That's not true. The Bible says that it sanctified. Now, the blood itself didn't do anything because it's what it pictured that did something. But it, it was sanctified. Why, why, why was it sanctified? Why, why did it sanctify? Because of what it was pointing to. It was pointing the way. Israel teaches us in the New Testament church age a vital lesson that when these pictures are discarded or destroyed, it takes the arrow off of the spiritual truth it represents. So when the family is destroyed, when a marriage doesn't operate right, when government doesn't operate right, and the people under it don't operate right, their whole view of God becomes diminished. It ruins their view of who an almighty God is. When the church doesn't run right, it destroys people's view of an almighty God, a holy God. It's no wonder Satan works so hard to destroy all these things. He, something Hebrews 10 soundly dismantles. 
specifically the church, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It's interesting, too, the word. It doesn't just say neglecting. It says forsaking. It, it, it comes with the idea of like a, a father who leaves his family, that forsakes it. He leaves it. It doesn't say neglect as the manner of some is. It says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some people have just made that a habit. Our societies are completely falling apart and rebelliousness to every authority of life is pervasive in our current world. When you destroy or even redefine the picture, you lose faith in the spiritual promise that it represents. Don't believe me? That's been the point he's been making all along. Consider Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. He says in Hebrews chapter 4, earlier in our text, and he, he started off, remember, he started off with the whole idea of the people that left the promised land. He said, let us therefore fear. This is something he's like, you need to be afraid of this. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. And what was the idea of rest? Well, the rest he's talking about here is the promised land. But he's using it as a light figure of what? What's he using it as a light figure of? Yeah, heaven. Entering into his rest. So he's using this figure of the promised land, which is what it was. He's using this idea of a figure for a spiritual or a doctrinal truth. He says, you need to be afraid of this because what will happen is you'll leave a promise or you'll come short of it. Verse 2, he says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. And again, he's talking to the old, about the Old Testament saints that didn't make it in the, that did not make it into the promised land. Now, was the gospel preached to the Old Testament saints in the Old Testament? Yeah. Jesus was the picture of it. He says it was preached to them as well as unto us. But listen to what he says. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed... For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. As I've sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all of his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in. Look, why? Because of unbelief. They didn't enter in because of unbelief. Do you know what happens when you and I ruin pictures of God? We cause people to lose faith. We lose faith. One of the reasons why we look back 100 years ago, in America, the divorce rate was down to nothing. A lot of people, and it actually now it's more than 100 years ago, but a lot of people didn't know people who were divorced. Is Satan has been so good at destroying families, it's destroyed the faith of a nation that was once called a Christian nation. I mean, you know, you may not agree from a freedom sense or a constitutional sense of prohibition but could you even imagine enough moral people who would stand up and say, this is a sin, we need to vote against it? I mean, we live in a society today of drugs everywhere and homeless everywhere and no one goes to church. What happened? All the pictures of Christ failed. They failed. That's not God's fault. That's ours. How come so many people didn't make it into the promised land? Well, for one, their leader destroyed a picture of Jesus Christ. He smote the rock instead of speaking to it. When you and I ruin a picture of Jesus Christ, and let me just tell you this, this is one of the reasons why you should fear. 
you should be afraid. Because it didn't just affect the children of Israel. Everybody in that generation died with the exception of two people. The kids made it. The younger ones made it. But the only people that made it were Caleb and Joshua. Everybody else perished. Why? They were constantly destroying pictures of Jesus Christ. You know, when we think once for all, we get all excited and we're like, man, once for all, Jesus took the sin of mankind on him. He took on our sin and, and he took it on his cross and he paid the penalty. And so now you don't have a priest going back and forth and ministering all the time. And this like figure is, is now gone because of what Jesus Christ did. But that's not the only thing that's going to be gone. And it's not the only thing that's sanctified. All the pictures of Jesus Christ or of God bring sanctification. 1 Corinthians 7, 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Well, wait a minute. Time out. Does this mean that if you've got a marriage and you've got an unsaved and a saved, that the, un the unsaved becomes saved? No. The sanctification comes in the institution. We could spend all night talking about this, but we as Christians need to be a whole lot more careful about how we deal with the pictures of the truth. It needs to be something we start considering because there are a lot of these things where the Bible just flat out says they're ministers of God. That's not just true of the leadership of the church. That's called in the leadership of government. It's called that in the home. It's called that also in the church. And it, it, it's, it's sad, I think, one of the reasons why we're seeing so much rebellion today and we're seeing a lot of Christians that are departing from the faith, is we have destroyed the pictures. And just like the Jews, we look at the Jews and we go, you guys missed out. I mean, here you are, you've been given this law, and this law totally points to the Messiah. Not only did you reject the Messiah, but you grabbed him and murdered him. Moms, what are we doing when we don't submit to a godly husband? Dads, what are we doing when we are not loving Amen. our wives? Amen. Children, what are we doing when we won't submit to our parents? Amen. Citizens of this country, what are you doing when you walk around snubbing your nose at the authority? It's not, it's not the people you're putting your fist in the face of. It's the God that pictures these things. And you say, well, what do you, why would you say once for all eliminates, eliminates not just the sin of man, but it eliminates all these pictures of Jesus Christ? Well, let me paint just a little picture here. In John chapter 19, verse 30, the Bible says this. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. This was on the cross. So he gets the vinegar and he says, it is finished. It's done. It's over. Mark chapter 15, verse 36, the Bible says, And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let alone, let's see whether Elias will come to take him. And Jesus cried with a loud voice. Well, we know from John what he said, because it's the same thing. They gave him vinegar. Matthew and Mark both say that he cried with a loud voice, but John tells you what he said. John said his last thing he said before he died, it's over, it's done, it is 
finished. And the Bible says this in Mark 15, 38. And he cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom. Matthew 27, 51 says it like this. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. This did not just finish your sin. It finished everything that pictured Jesus Christ. Because what is the whole premise that we've been talking about? The tabernacle of God is someday going to be with men. Revelation tells us that. There's no more tabernacle. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us there's no more church. We're come unto Mount Zion, unto the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. No more of this. And I'm going to be more than happy to take a side seat at that point in time. <laughs> I'll tell you, there are times I'd be happy to do it now. But, but there's not going to be any more church. It's going to be done. It's going to be done away with. That, why is that picture done? Because once for all, when he died, all of the pictures of Christ, are, it, it made them all to be realized. Mark chapter 12, verse 24, And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye, do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, Neither they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. So another institution of God. When did it end? When they rose from when Jesus rose from the dead. We get to we get to enjoy the picture down here on this earth. But listen, your wife isn't going to be your wife when you get to heaven. Why? Because the spiritual truth is going to be replaced by the physical truth. Or, or the, the physical is going to be replaced by the spiritual. It represents God. It's going to be done. It's going to be gone. No more marriage. There's no marriage in heaven. And I know, it doesn't seem like that should be... You're like, how in the world can we be happy? You're going to have 24 hour, 7 day, 7 day a week, 24 hour a day access, if there were time, there's no time in heaven, to God all the time. The picture of marriage is the relationship between Christ and the church. Same thing's going to be true with government. Revelation 19, 13 through 16. And he, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen and white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Until this happens... You and I better make sure the picture that we represent and everybody in this room represents a picture of God in one way or another. We better make sure that that picture of God in every area of life is accurate to the Lord and Savior as we possibly can make it. It's not just our lives and our souls that are at stake, but that one-time sacrifice also means there's no going back. There's no more continual sacrifice. And this is the double-edged sword of once for all. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, the Bible says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. I think there's a message and there's something you and I need to grasp out of this. 
yeah, the law had a lot of problems and it was never going to be as good as the sacrifice that came from heaven. As Hebrews 9 says, heaven had better things. But this is the thing. It's a once for all. One time for all. And this is how this chapter ends for us. The Bible says, nor yet that he should offer himself often. As the high priest entereth not into the holy place, entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he, have, he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. So the Bible is saying, hey, if this was, an, if this was an, a completely accurate picture, Jesus Christ would be crucified afresh. He would have to keep going back. But this puts a huge responsibility on you and I to understand this because it's once for all, there is no going back. For the person that's here that's saved, there's no going back. It's even interesting when you think about it, I believe in 1 Peter and Ephesians chapter 1 talks about the fact that when Jesus Christ died, he went and he led captivity captive. When we read Luke chapter 16, there was a place called paradise and a place of hell and they could see one another. No one went to heaven. They were waiting for this once for all to happen. But this is the thing. Once it's happened, there's no going back. There's no going back. There's no more, there's no more uh, uh, often sacrificed for sins because as our chapter put it, puts it, the reformation has happened. It's occurred. And the Bible says, For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. I often wonder if the fact that it was the, all those that were resurrected from the dead, that died and were resurrected from the dead, all happened before Jesus Christ died. If maybe there's a message in that too. It can't happen again. It's appointed unto men once to die. Then the judgment. So, what does this mean for us? Christ was, was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for Him shall He appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Listen, when He appears the second time, there will be no second chance. It's important for us to know that with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ comes a huge responsibility. They did not know what we have the privilege of knowing today. And I kind of wonder too if that's one of the reasons why some of the things that pictured God, it seems like there was a lot more leniency on it. Say, well, like, for example, what? Marriage. It... it you ever look at the Old Testament and go, why in the world did he allow polygamy? Why in the world was there seemed to be just casual provisions for things like divorce? The picture is Christ. And the picture now is complete. Once for all. It's not just your sin. It's everything that pictures him. It's interesting that even though there was polygamy, certainly has been in polygamy in the New Testament, I can't find one mention of polygamy after the death of Jesus Christ. Why? All these things picture our Lord and Savior. Once for all. How are you and I living? The question today is, if people were to look at my life, if people were to look at my marriage, if people were to look at my family, what would their faith in God 
look like? And would they even have any? The children of Israel so messed up the picture of God in the law that the Jews not only rejected Jesus Christ, they murdered him. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I remember years ago seeing a bumper sticker that said, Lord, save me from your followers. And I fear that sometimes that's the case. Over years and decades of pastoring in a church, I'm often alarmed at what happens in Christian lives, Christian young people, Christian marriages, Christian families. And, and, and I, it's no wonder why so many people reject the faith based on what they're seeing from the Christians that represent it. It's, it's not just you and I being kind people. It's you and I being righteous people, just people, merciful people. It's us presenting an accurate depiction of the Christ that we represent. Once for all, someday, that all the things we're used to in this world, they're all going to be gone because all of the things that we look at, be it marriage, be it church, government, all those things are going to be contained in one person, just like the tabernacle. There is no tabernacle in heaven. It's Jesus Christ. There is no marriage in heaven. It's Jesus Christ. There's no government in heaven. It's Jesus Christ. There's no church in heaven. We come unto Mount Zion. It's it's the church of the firstborn. It's Jesus Christ. And what a, what a thing to think. You know, it's one thing to be called an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And we are that. It's one thing for us to have a ministry of reconciliation, and we certainly do. But every single person in this room, man, woman, and child, in some form or some way, represents an aspect of God or of Jesus Christ. And I'm curious today if we even give that a thought when we're mouthing off to our mom and dad. I wonder if we even give that a thought when we're scolding our wife or, or we're smarting off to our husband or we're gossiping about a pastor or somebody in church. Do you realize it's not just things that happen. You're destroying either your, your own faith or someone else's. And that's why I think we're losing so many young people today in our churches. They go through high school and they come out and they're like, there's nothing there. The world has more for me than this does. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be the people we are supposed to be. And Lord, as we... We know these things, but God, sometimes we don't understand how deep the perspectives go. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would help us to be the people you've called us to be. Help us, God, to love you, to serve you. And Lord, that we would represent you well. God, in some cases, that we would just represent you. Lord, I pray that you would embolden us, not just to witness with our mouths, but God, to witness with our lives. We love you and we praise you for it. Thank you for the like figures you've given us in this. And Lord, we are thankful, even with the great responsibility, you died once for all and you put away sins once, for, once and for all. Thank you so much for doing that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. Hymn number 352, Whiter Than Snow.
would you close? Actually, Brother Walzak, it's good to see you. Forget about you, Brandon. <laughs> Brother Walzak, would you close us in prayer tonight? Lord God, we want to just thank you for the, the preaching tonight, Lord, and just the safety and the, the ability we have to come to a church, Lord, and as our world seems to get crazier and crazier, it's, it's nice to be able to come back to a place where we could um, recharge our batteries to learn more about you, to learn how to serve you better so that others can be saved, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.